But we're leaving Amblin. This has been your home since 84, right? Yeah, this has been, I built the building in, uh, began it in 83, and we finished it like eight months later in 84. And I think because with the BFG opening, the idea was, where are your old stomping grounds? Get it? Stomping grounds. <laughs> well, I have not left giant country. <laughs> Since I entered Giant Country, which was here at Universal Studios, this has been my Giant Country. I've yeah. always said that this is, Universal has been my ancestral home <laughs> all these years. Are the stories true that you used to sneak onto the lot here when you were a young guy? Yeah. How old? Probably about 16. So you couldn't be tried as an adult at that point? No, I would have definitely been taken to juvenile court and gotten a suspended sentence for giving it a good try. But I wasn't caught, thank goodness. I had a pass for three days and I just took a chance. The guard would remember I had been, I had been here on three consecutive so you're days. you regular. I walked in with no pass the fourth day and he waved me through and it was that way for the next three months of my summer vacation. Really? This is how I spent my summer vacation. Just coming in and what would you do? I would just in. watch television shows being shot. I would go all around the lot. Watching the kind of coordination on a set, just watching, everybody knew what they needed to do, and they did their jobs, and it was very much like uh, a kind of uh, team sport. Did you see any filmmakers that you admired? Hitchcock, but I got thrown off that set very no. quickly. I was on the torn curtain set for about 10 minutes before someone came and told me to leave. Did that you was, get to see him? I and, got like, to see Hitchcock and Julie Andrews, but they were, I was on the Phantom of the Opera stage. They were far away, uh -huh. and I had just come through an entrance. I was at the back of the theater. There were 500 extras in the seats. That's when um, an AD or a second, maybe even a third AD, got kicked off by a third AD. Well, uh, so they show me your papers? Or, uh, just said, why are you here? And I said, I'm just here to watch. And they said, well, no, this is a closed set. And that was the end of it. This is Courthouse Square. This is, this is where we shot Back to the Future. And that was the, the clock tower. There's the time already set on the clock tower. But this existed before Back to the Future, right? It was... Uh... It, yeah, this was always here. We just uh, used what was available to us. So but that gas station we put in for uh, Back to the Future too. Was it used for a lot of like just random TV shows and movie sets? Or anything? Oh, yeah, it's been used for everything. It's been used for television series, movies. Before Back to the Future, did it have a most famous use? Uh, it was used, uh, I think, to kill a mockingbird shot a little bit here. Uh, there were a lot of television shows that shot here, but this is most known for Back to the Future now. Right. At, least, at least that's for the trams today. <laughs> the tour guides tell everybody this is most known for Back to the Future. We like that. you got to watch out. There's so many tours here now. Yeah. It used to be just I could just slip up and down these streets, and, but I know how to get there because I go up Steven Spielberg Drive. That's good. Right yeah, here. you know that one. <laughs> I, know to, I know how to get up there. I love being bifurcated with Jimmy Stewart. That's a great honor, actually. Having the corner of Stewart and Spielberg. I love that. That's, that's <laughs> one of the greatest honors of my life, is being able to share a street sign with Jimmy Stewart. So this just goes up, and these these were all. Remember how many westerns they made in the 50s and right. 60s? So the, the, these were probably the most uh, uh, the most utilized back lot in history was back here, and they were just western streets as far as the eye could see. Even more in, in the old days that were taken down for other uh, sets. Mm -hmm. So it goes from western to kind of Spanish. Sort of Mexican style architecture, if you're this doing is the, it, yeah, south of the yeah, border. Exactly. Kind of thing. And then this is Jaws. I'll tell you, the, the orca used to be right there. I tell you that story no. in one of our many interviews. No, no. Uh, the orca was here. The real the orca the right here. Orca? The original orca was here. And I used to come out for about a couple of years after I made the movie to get all over my PTSD. I would just I would work through my own trauma, because it was tra traumatic. From making that film. film? Sitting in that boat alone for hours. I would just really? sit in that boat alone for hours, just working through, and I would shake. I'd get in the boat and I, my hands would shake. And uh, and then I, I was fine, and mm -hmm. five, six years went by. I hadn't seen the boat in five years. So I just come back and revisit it. It was gone. Somebody, unbeknownst to me or Sid Scheinberg, who ran the studio, yeah. had torn it up and just thrown it away, T thrown the entire boat away. Because they said they said there was dry rot, there were termites. Well, of course there were termites and dry rot. I'm going to actually ask them to rebuild it and put it back here. I'm going to actually see if they'll do that. Because the, tour, the tourists would love to see the orchestra. So here. it was just a chance to kind of commune with that experience? And yeah, sort of and, like... and the experience was very good to me, as you know. The experience gave me complete freedom for the rest of my career. The amount of success the film enjoyed 
just gave me final cut. Yep. Yeah. It gave me a chance to tell my own stories. Steven Spielberg Drive is a long road. It's a long road. <laughs> it's a long and winding road. <laughs> Suddenly I feel like I'm doing a James Corden interview. Exactly, yeah. Um, we'll start karaoke soon. There we go. So so you know what this is. This is uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. This is Ronnie Howard's movie, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which is very, very uh, it's nice they kept this up. Yeah. And then right around the corner is the infamous Bates yeah. Motel. There it is. And uh, it hasn't changed very much. Same color. They haven't even repainted this place. It's, I think they've replaced some light bulbs. But wow. This was the just an amazing piece of art direction to have this here and have the, you know, the Nor Norman Bates' mother's house right up there. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. And it all seems so small now, you know? When you see the movie, it all looks bigger. Yeah, just funny thing about movies, they make everything look bigger. Well, that's a little bit of foreshortening, right? Or actors look bigger, they make directors seem bigger. <laughs> but we're not, we're really not. So this is, and it was interesting when I shot War of the Worlds here, this is where Rick Carter located the 747 crash. Mm -hmm. And we bought it for, I think, $50,000 and cut it up into little pieces, brought it up here and built this neighborhood. Uh, for the crash site. So the houses weren't here the, yet. The, the, these, added we added these houses. This was part of the Rick Carter's uh, production design to have this entire plane crash right in the middle of the neighborhood. Wow. And then shear the house that they were hiding in in half, as you, as you remember mm -hmm. from, from the film. So all of, all of these, uh, it's just kind of scary to come up here. It's just, mm -hmm. When you see the movie, you'll notice there's not a single body in the scene. Yeah. There's no bodies in the airplane and no bodies on the ground. That was an illusion that seeing the empty seats I thought was more powerful mm -hmm. than having a bunch of dummies or extras. Right. Not to be confused, by the way. <laughs> but, but, but we had mannequins strapped into the, to the, to the seats. It was a lot more horrible, I thought, just to have the whole thing empty. And then this is where Lost World was. This is the Lost World set. Oh, no way. This was uh, the, the second uh, visitor center right up here, the right around the corner. So that invokes, invokes some memories, actually. Yeah, like yeah. What, what, what kind? how bloody hard all these movies are to do. <laughs> <laughs> just, Brings I, back like stress I've memory. never had a cakewalk. I have never made a movie that could be, you know, subtitled The Cakewalk. Some of my films might seem like cakewalks, but they're not at all. You know, I like coming on to each movie, you know, with my experience not being what is going to keep me out of trouble. Yeah. Um, that's how you, you mix it up, how you can stay fresh, right? Yeah. I think you told me before, Spilkus, nerves are a good thing it's when good. you're filming, right? Nerves are good. <laughs> They're good. The announcement of Indiana Jones 5 is coming up. Well, You've that, heard that, about that, right? Yeah, somebody, <laughs> somebody told me I'm, I'm scheduled to make one of those again someday, but that's not for a couple of years. And Ready Player One in between that? And Ready Player One is what I'm going off next yeah. month to do. When you were prowling around the, the studio as a 16-year-old. Were there things you learned that became valuable or was it more just inspiration? I, I basically I took a master course in film editing mm -hmm. because it was a lot harder to stay on a set for an extended period of time without really, without me being questioned, what am I doing here? Right. Uh, but, but the editors embraced me and all of them did. I probably learned more in editorial sneaking around here than I did on any soundstage. How did you introduce yourself to them? Like, you just come I, I, I told the truth. I told the truth. I told all the editors I was unofficially here to learn how to be a director. Uh -huh. And nobody blew a whistle on me, and uh, <laughs> they liked having me around, and they played a couple of jokes on me. Like the day they asked me to go, like, down to an editing room and take a film bin, a 16-millimeter film bin out of that editing room and bring it to the main lobby. And I did it because they, it was suddenly somebody's asking me to do something. Yeah, great thing, I got a job. Great. So I ran into the room and there was some guy half naked, you know, behind the moviola. He had, he had no, sh I don't know if he was dressed from below the waist. He had just was totally stark naked from the waist up and he was cutting on this thing. I said, excuse me. And I took the bin out of the room and the guy stands up, starts shouting at me with, using a lot of inappropriate language. And I immediately recognized him. It was Marlon Brando. I ran out of the room without the bin, and the editors were suppressing their laughter because they didn't want to be heard by Brando, but they were on the floor. They were rolling on desks. They were laughing so hard. What was going on? Brando apparently was cutting a documentary on Tahiti, oh, and they right. had lent him a room, and they played this, they kind of, uh, 
I guess, punked me. <laughs> so he was Early in there. Punking so days. He was in there going tribal, and they just he, he was he was tribal. He, him. When he stood up, I think he was wearing bathing trunks. But uh, <laughs> that was that was the only time I ever saw Brando in the flesh. <laughs> you get to see a lot of him. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. This is really fun.